That's my half of the camera, mate. Oh, cheers. Hello. <laughs> anyway, what are you doing for Easter? What you got planned? Oh, here we go again. What? You and Easter. Are you going to start telling me about your whole Jesus conspiracy? <sighs> the guy who died and came back to life? First of all, it's just a school holiday. Like, that's not my fault. It's just seeing what you were getting up to. Secondly, not conspiracy. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Three facts to prove it is, mate. Oh, here we Number go. one, yeah. he died on a cross. He probably just fainted as mates took him away. Fainted? Do you know anything about crucifixion or what he went through? He wasn't going to faint from that, mate, honestly. Mate, number two, right. They put his body in a tomb yeah. and then they found it empty. Yeah, the empty tomb. Yeah, it was probably empty from the start. Was, even if he was dead, his mates probably just jacked his body and ran off with it. You, no, they, why would they rob his body? What are they going to get out of that? Well, that leads me on to number three. They've been following him around for the past three years, yeah. giving up everything their yeah. whole lives, and then he dies. He was worth it. Yeah, they thought he was the Messiah who couldn't. Yeah. He was God, but no, he died. So they probably just hired a flipping lookalike like Justin Bieber when he ate that taco sideways. <laughs> right. Look. What, what reason do they have to make stuff up or make it fake? I mean, they've given their whole lives, yeah, but they weren't going to get anything out of it. What was the point in that? Exactly. They didn't want to look like idiots afterwards. Oh, grief. I, do you know what? You just need to look into some of this stuff. I'm having a conversation with you on Easter or Jesus or anything like that. It's a flipping night. Oh, mate, you and your niece. So I wonder, have you ever been in a conversation like that or seen it happen or heard it take place with the name of Jesus? The one that we believe as Christians rose from the dead for us, for our sin. His name is attacked and undermined. You believe in that rubbish? That conspiracy? Are you crazy? Well, in Acts 1.3, it says this. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And so today we're going to look at these conspiracies briefly and have a discussion over them and see actually it takes more faith and belief to believe that he wasn't raised from the dead than if he was. So let's start from the beginning. Hey, oh, here we number go. one, yeah. he died on a cross. He probably just fainted as mates took him away. Whoa, hang on a second. Hold the thought. Are you saying he didn't really die? He just faked it or fainted and then woke up afterwards? Hang on. Do you know who these people were, these Romans? They're basically professional murderers. <laughs> uh, no, not quite like that. Um, but I can tell you one thing. These Romans really knew how to kill people. I mean, crucifixion was the slowest, most painful, most humiliating way to die. And these Romans, just to be sure that they'd done the job properly, when it got to the end of the time on the cross, they would take a spear and they would place it into the side of the people they were punishing, straight through to the heart, just so they could say conclusively that that criminal was dead. It is historically factual to say that Jesus Christ died on the cross at Calvary. Now, let's go to number two. Let's start. Is even if he was dead, his mates probably just jacked his body and ran off with it. Another conspiracy theory, the empty tomb. Well, surely there's some logical explanation for that, right? I mean, they clearly just stole the body, didn't they? Well, unfortunately that doesn't add up either. You see, the fact that the authorities were accusing the disciples of stealing Jesus' body tells you a couple of things. It tells you that one, they acknowledged that the tomb was empty. That's the first thing. And B, it tells you that they didn't know where the body was. You see, they hated Jesus. They hated everything he stood for and the way he was changing the culture around them and the way he was speaking against them. But the fact that the tomb was empty and that they didn't know where the body was posed a problem. And so the only thing they could do was just whitewash them, tar them, accuse them and try and turn people against them. Because if they knew where the body was, they'd have shown people, they'd have displayed it for all to see and said, look, here's the proof, here's the evidence that he wasn't resurrected, that he wasn't the Messiah, that he wasn't the son of God. 
let's take a look at the next one right, so they probably just had a flipping look-alike like justin bieber when he ate that taco sideways <laughs> so another conspiracy theory that all those first-hand eyewitness accounts of jesus beyond his resurrection that they're all fake false untrue but how does that work out exactly I mean, in the Bible, we read about 500 different people coming into contact with Jesus, whether it was eating with him or speaking with him or being in community with him. But also, we see historical writers outside of the Bible, people like Josephus, who wrote about Jesus before and after his resurrection. And historically, normally, they'd look at maybe just a couple of um, resources from the time that would say, yeah, that's reliable. But here we have an overwhelming landslide victory in terms of historical evidence to say that Jesus was around after his death. And look at Peter, for example. He denied Jesus three times before he died on the cross. It's a really well-known story. He didn't even want association with him. And yet, after he comes back from the dead, there's this shift. Peter hasn't just heard about the resurrection. He has seen and experienced it. He is now willing to lay down his life for the name of Jesus. He's willing to lay down his life. Willing. But you know, it wasn't just Peter that was willing to lay his life down for Jesus. Actually, we know that out of the 12 disciples, 11 of them ended up being killed for what they believed. We call it being martyred. Now just think about that for a second. These people, these first-hand eyewitnesses of Jesus and his time on earth. If what they were following and if what they had encountered wasn't true, wasn't reliable it was all fake why on earth would so many of them be so willing to lay down their own lives for that that just doesn't make sense now today Easter Sunday is a day to uh, proclaim the name of Jesus the fact that he is risen and it's a time of joy and celebration but you know Jesus never intended for that to be just for the one day. You see, if all of those conspiracies were true, if this really was all fake, then for me as a Christian, it would have been a waste of time. It would be a waste of time me sitting here talking to you now. The whole thing around Christianity would be, would be dumb, useless. But you know, I don't believe that at all. And if he is true, if it is real, this resurrection that we proclaim on Easter Sunday, then that changes everything. And when we accept that, when we come to the conclusion that actually, do you know what, it takes more faith to believe that he wasn't real than if he was, then that means we can't stay where we are. And not just for today, but for all the days ahead. So in this time, especially a time when we're socially distanced, isolated, cut off from people, the world is in a real place of suffering. Actually, when we recognise who Jesus is, the hope and the future he's given us by conquering death, that we, having our sins forgiven, might also inherit new life with him. How is that going to change our outlook on the world? How's that going to change how we talk to those in our household or on the street or those times when we have to go shopping and we're kind of separated from people and we're, we're people are tense and under pressure and full of anxiety. How will it change how we speak to them and live alongside them and love them? Jesus isn't a fairy tale. Jesus claimed to be the son of God. And that's why they chose to crucify him. And I don't know if 
if you've ever heard this quote, but if you like music, um, the lead singer of U2, Bono, some of you younger people out there might not know who that is, but for those of you who know Bono, he said, you know, he was crucified because he claimed to be the son of God. So he either was the son of God or he was nuts. There's no room for middle ground. So today, if you believe he was the son of God, it's a time for celebration and reaffirming what it looks like to live that out in the everyday. And if you don't, my challenge to you is look up the evidence. Go search it out for yourself. Look at these convincing proofs that Luke mentions at the beginning of Acts and see for yourself that he really was the son of God. He really did die for your sins and he really has risen again. And he's just waiting for you to accept it. Now we're going to pray and we're going to go into a time of response with Jamie. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email us or drop us a line because we'd love to talk to you about it. But yeah, let's pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, we just give you all the praise, Lord. Out of the sadness of Good Friday, the sadness of you going to the cross and being punished. And punished for a perfect life. Lord, we just praise your name that you rose again. We praise your name for the empty tomb. And we just celebrate and, um, and just give thanks for the joy in our hearts that, that it's all true. That you're reliable, that you're unchanging. And even today you're changing lives, Lord. That because you rose again, everything changed. We are free from sin and have a relationship with you. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, and because we love you.